and I invite you to find uh, in your Bible this morning, if you, uh, in your own copy, whether that's paper or digital, Romans chapter 5. We're going to read verses 18 through 19 this morning. And as you find your way to Romans chapter 5, which my profession of faith kids is in the New Testament, uh, we're going to talk about what we in the Reformed tradition call the covenant of grace. Uh, while you'll see the word covenant in the Bible a lot, you won't see the term covenant of grace. Uh, so why do we use it? We use it because there are a group of saving covenants that God makes in the Bible with his people. And since God says that we're saved by grace, uh, we've decided that we could just sort of talk about his saving gov covenants under the name, the covenant of grace. Now, while there are a few covenants that we talk about under this title, the most important one, because it gets talked about most in the Bible, is God's covenant with Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. So we're going to talk about that covenant this morning, but we're not only going to talk about that covenant, because there's another covenant in the Bible that God has in mind when he makes his covenant with Abraham. And that is God's covenant with Adam in Genesis chapter 2, which our confession, I think, beautifully calls the covenant of life. In Romans 5, verses 18 to 19, Paul is talking about how God has shown his love for us in sending Jesus to die for us while we were still sinners. And as he's talking about that, he brings these two covenants together, the one with Abraham and the one with Adam, when he talks about two men, Adam and Jesus, and how Adam's sin brought us all death, and how Jesus' life and obedience brings all of us people life. What I hope we'll see this morning as we reflect on Romans chapter 5, verses 18 through 19, and also Genesis 2 and Genesis 15, which is what Paul's point is based on, is that God's covenant of grace is his promise to love us back to life. God's promise to love us back to life. So let's read uh, Romans 5, verses 18 through 19. We'll pray. And then uh, using Paul's words, we'll turn to Genesis 2. We'll turn to Genesis 15 and we'll ask first, why does one man's sin lead to death? And then we'll ask, why does one man's act of righteousness lead to life? And then finally, we'll conf conclude by looking at how God loves us back to life. Let's read Romans 5, verses 18 through 19 together. This is God's word. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Thus far the reading of what can truly only be God's own word. Let's pray together. Our God and Father, we very much desire to have your word change our lives, to change how we see you and one another, and to grow our love for you and for one another. And so, Father, we pray that your spirit would go forth now and would give us ears to hear and minds to understand and hearts to believe. Father, may the words of my mouth as your preacher and the meditation of our hearts as those called to hear and respond to your word. May it all now be pleasing in your sight. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so the first thing we need to ask ourselves is, why does one man's sin lead to death? Now, clearly, because Paul names him twice back in verse 14, this one man's sin who leads us to death is Adam. And the reason why Adam's sin leads to our condemnation and death, and even to our own innate sinfulness, as Paul says earlier in chapter 5, all of that is found back in Genesis chapter 2. So I invite you to turn back to Genesis chapter 2 with me, specifically to verse 15 of Genesis chapter 2. And just remember, kids, uh, the big numbers in the Bible, those are the chapters, and the small ones are the verses. So turn to Genesis chapter 2. And as you turn there, I'm going to give you a little background. God has just created the heavens and the earth out of nothing. He's planted a garden in Eden, and he's formed Adam out of the dust of the ground. But he hasn't made Eve yet. This is important. And in verse 15, 
we read that God takes Adam, who is still by himself, and we, say, and we read this in verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. I need to point out a couple of things here. First, I need to point out that in the ancient world, covenants had a fairly standard structure, which included the people involved, uh, so like who the covenant is made with, the terms, what each person is going to do, and then the blessings and curses that come from doing or not doing what the covenant said. So here's the rewards if you do what you say you're going to do, and here is what's going to happen that's bad, the curses, the, the justice, if you don't do what you say is going to happen. Uh, so this passage has all of those standard parts. The people involved are Adam and God, not Eve. Eve is super important, uh, but the covenant here doesn't focus on her. It focuses on Adam, and we're going to talk about that more in a second. It has terms, specifically. Adam can eat from everything in the garden except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And then it has the curse. If you eat of it, if you eat of that tree, you will surely die. And just so you know, these parts are so obviously covenantal that roughly 800 years later, Hosea, chapter 6, verse 8, if I remember right, uh, will explicitly talk about God's covenant with Adam. Now with that, I want to focus on two things that matter to Paul's argument in Romans 5. The first is that even though only the curse is mentioned in Genesis 2, there's clearly an implied blessing, right? The implied blessing is, if you don't eat of the tree, you will get life. And this implied blessing is why our Reformed tradition calls this God's covenant of life with Adam, because the point of their relationship is not death. God didn't say this and say, so make sure you eat of it because I really want you to die. Right? The point is life. In the beginning, God didn't create in order to kill. He created in order to live with all of his creation in peace and in joy and in love forever, which means he created in order to love his creation forever. And in the Bible, being loved by God and living with God are always connected. And that should make sense to us because ultimately, when we say that we love someone, we are also saying that we want to spend time with them, to be with them, to enjoy their company. It doesn't make any sense for me to say, I love my wife and kids, but I never ever want to see them or spend time with them ever. What would that possibly mean? Right? To love someone is to want to be with them, to live with them in some form. God created because he wants to live with us so that he can love us and so that we can love him. So the first thing we need to see then is that this covenant, while it specifically talks about death, is really aimed at life. The second thing we need to see is that Adam is by himself. And in Romans 5, 18 and 19, we heard Paul talk about the one man. And he gets that point from the fact that when God enters into this covenant with Adam here in Genesis 2, Eve is not there yet. So in Paul's mind, and I think in the Bible's mind, that makes Adam our representative. The old theological term, if you're into old theological terms, is federal head. And all that means is that Adam acts on behalf of all humanity, so that if Adam had obeyed and received the blessing of eternal life, we would have, have received the blessings of eternal life because he obeyed. It would be credited to us. And of course, if Adam disobeyed and received the curse of death like he did, we would get the curse of death because of his disobedience. And that is, in fact, what the Bible says happened. Now, this idea of getting credit for someone else's obedience or disobedience is very important in the Bible, and it's very important in Christianity. So when God talks about having Jesus's righteousness being counted to us 
so that we are made righteous through Jesus by faith, as he says in Romans 4 and Genesis 15, which we'll see in a second, that is just the idea that you are getting credit for Jesus' work. The theological term we use for that is imputation. But if you just wanted to say counted, getting credit uh, for something, it's all the same thing. And this is why Genesis, it is in, Genesis, in Genesis 3, it isn't until after Adam eats the fruit that the curse of sin and death falls on all of humanity because he is our representative. But that isn't the way that it was supposed to be. God's covenant with Adam was aimed at life, right? Its purpose was to confirm our eternal life with God in love forever. So now God begins a rescue operation. And I'm just going to skip over so many things. I want to talk about like how God in his mercy limits death's effects so that he can rescue us. I want to talk about Genesis 3.15, God's promise for an offspring that will come and crush the serpent's head. Uh, we just don't have time for that. Uh, and besides, we're technically focusing on Romans 5, 18 and 19. So let's stick to the plan. Our first question was, how does one man's disobedience bring death? The answer is because Adam was our representative who broke God's covenant of life. And we all have disobedience counted to us. <coughs> but Paul says there's another one man, the man, Jesus Christ, whose one act of righteousness brings us all the life that Adam lost us. Now, to understand why Paul says that, we need to go back to Genesis chapter 15 and think about God's covenant with Abraham. So I invite you to turn to Genesis 15. And as you do, uh, let me again give you a little context. God has called Abraham, who in our text is still just called Abram, out of his homeland to walk with him, that is to walk by faith. And he's promised Abraham that he would bless the nations, bless the world, through him, by giving him three things, children, a land, and a relationship with him. In other words, God's promises to give Abraham a life with him that he can pass on to his children and that his children can offer to the nation so that the world is blessed. It's how God is going to pursue uh, removing the curse of death so that he can live with us in blessing and life again forever. Well, Abraham is old, and Sarah, his wife, is old. They're in their upper 90s. No kids yet. And so we read this in Genesis chapter 15, starting in verse 1. I'm going to read here through verse 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. I want you to notice that uh, last verse especially. And he believed the Lord and it was counted to him as righteousness. Right? Righteousness is the thing that we need if we're going to live with God forever. Uh, righteousness is what Adam didn't have and what we don't have after he sinned. So question, is Abraham then a sinner? Yes, most definitely. And if you don't believe me, read a few chapters earlier when he lies about who his wife is, right? And if you wonder if that is actually offensive, ask your parents if it would be okay if they lied about who their mom and dad, who their wife. It's not going to go well. Um, so yeah, he's a sinner. But here we read that because he trusted in God's promises— because he had faith, right? Faith just means trust. Because he had faith in God, he had righteousness counted to him, like we talked about. He, has, he got righteousness that he needed 
credited to him, imputed to him, because he put his trust in God and his promises. And this gets then quoted explicitly by Paul in Romans chapter 4 when he talks about how we, are, we know that we are made right with God, or as Paul says, justified to God by faith in Jesus. But that raises a question, or at least it should, it does for Paul in Romans. How can trust in God free us from sin's consequences? How can God treat faith as something that gives us access to eternal life with him without turning his justice into something sort of arbitrary and meaningless? The answer to that question is what comes next in Genesis 15. So in verses 7 through 20, we read about how God enters into a covenant with Abraham. And this covenant-making ceremony that we see here is as traditional as it gets. So we read this starting in verse 9 of uh, Romans chapter, or excuse me, Genesis chapter 15. He, that's God, said to him, Abraham, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, laid them each, laid each half over against each other, but he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. The animals God tells Abraham to prepare are the animals that you would offer to God if you were poor. That's the turtle doves and the pigeons. Middle class, that's the rams and the goats. Or if you were very wealthy, the heifer, the cow. They also represent every kind of animal that will eventually be offered by Israel either for sin or for thanksgiving or for weddings, births, funerals. So this covenant ceremony represents every part of life and every position of life. It represents us in our joys and sorrows and in our sins, in our need for forgiveness. And the reason why God has them lay each half over against each other is so that as they sat there, the blood from each half was going to pull together in the middle and create a road of blood. Yes, I agree with that reaction. Now, the reason for that is that in traditional covenant ceremonies, each party walks through the path of blood and says, if I don't keep my part of this covenant, you can do this to me. You can kill me and walk through my blood as we've killed these animals and walk through their blood. So in terms of the covenant, you have the parties, Abraham, including his offspring, and God. You have the terms. God says explicitly, I will give you a relationship with me that includes a people and a land. And also, you, I think, have implied terms to Abraham. Follow me, right? Follow me by faith. And then you have the curse. If I don't do what I'm promising, you can do this to me. Now look at verse 12. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abraham, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. I think that darkness represents Abraham's dread, that is, his deep fear. Who here has followed Jesus perfectly? Even up to this point, Abraham hasn't followed Jesus perfectly. So what's going to happen when he walks through the pathway of blood? Well, eventually he's going to die. Now look at verse 17 in the first half of verse 18. So God has a little speech to Abraham. And then it says, When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between the pieces. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. Who walks through the pathway? Jesus. Who doesn't walk through the pathway? Abraham. God takes on everyone's obligations in this covenant. God not only tells Abraham, if I don't keep my covenant with you, you can do this to me. He also says, Abraham, when you fail me, you can do this to me. 
In other words, no matter what happens, Abraham, I will live with you. I will live with you. I will live with your people. I will bless the nations through your relationship with me. I will give myself to your children and to the nation in love, even if it kills me. Now from there, go back to Paul's statement in Romans chapter 5, verse 18, that Jesus' one act of righteousness brings life to us all. What is that one act? It's Jesus keeping his promise to Abraham that he would die for us to give us the blessing of his loving relationship and to bear the curse for our sins, for our failures, for our lack of faith, for our evil doing. Now, there's so many things we could add to this. I could talk about how Jesus' life of, of obedience is as important as his death on the cross. We could talk about how God's promise to Eve that she would bear a son who would cross the serpent's head and how it connects directly to God's promise to Abraham to give him offspring. We could talk about so many things. But for day, today, I just want to add two things as we sort of move to our close here. And the first is, Paul can compare the one man, Adam, and the one man, Jesus, because both of them are representatives. Adam represented us in the covenant of life in the garden. Jesus represents God and us in God's covenant of grace with Abraham. And this representation is very important, right? If you're represented by Adam, as we all are, then you have all the consequences of Adam's sin. But if you're represented by Jesus, you have all the consequences of Jesus' obedience and death, which means you have the forgiveness of sins. You have Jesus' righteousness counted to you, though you don't deserve it. And of course, neither do I. You have the adoption as sons and daughters into the family of God through Jesus. You have the Holy Spirit given to you as a down payment of God's promises of eternal life with him. And we could just go on and on and on as God does in Romans and in Hebrews and in Colossians and in Philippians. The blessings that come from being represented by Jesus are immense and they are eternal. Uh, but that leads me to the second thing that I want to add, which is how do you get Jesus as your covenant representative? The answer that Paul gives in Romans 4, and that we see so clearly in Genesis 15, is faith. When you put your trust in Jesus for salvation, it is counted as righteousness. That's what the Bible says. And this is why the Bible says that while all people are sinners, because everyone is represented by Adam. Not everyone is saved because not everyone is represented by Christ. But God says, to everyone who repents and believes, there is life in Jesus. In other words, you can be saved. And this is the gospel. And it's the gospel we have because Jesus made a covenant of grace with Abraham. And that gospel can be yours and it will be yours when you repent and believe in Jesus. And if there's anyone out there who wants to talk with me more about this after the service, I am, or during the week, I am available. I would love to have a fuller conversation with that with you. Uh, but let me just conclude with this this morning. I said at the beginning that the covenant of grace is God's promise to love us back to life. And I hope you can see now why I said it that way. God was not about to let his desire to live with us forever in love be thwarted. And he set out on a rescue plan. And that plan involved him dying for us so that we could live with him forever. And in that light, is it any wonder then that the Bible celebrates God's love the way that it does? Is it any wonder that we're told that God's love is higher than the mountains, that it's wider than the distance between the east and the west? Is it any wonder that the context for Romans 5, 18 through 19 is Paul's statement in Romans 5, verse 8. But God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. My friends, Jesus has loved us back to life as he promised to do in his covenant of grace by dying in our place, by bearing the curse. Let's trust him
and enjoy the blessings of life he's brought to us by following by faith. Amen? Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you for your covenant of grace with Abraham. Thank you that you fulfilled your promise to love us back to life. Father, please write this gospel work of Jesus on our hearts so that we can follow you by faith and have uh, an ever-growing confidence that because of Jesus, we are your people and we are righteous in your sight and will certainly live with you forever because you have loved us back to life through Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. In response, it's good.